Hi, Barbara. Hello, Debbie. I understand that you were born and raised here in Fort Collins. Yes, I was. I bet you've seen a lot of technological advances in your time here. Oh, I have indeed. I have seen this grow from a very small town to a place where people are doing all kinds of technological things I never would have dreamed of when I was a child. It's exciting. It is. So you lived um, east of College Avenue when you were a little girl. Yes. And you went to Harris Elementary School. I did. What are some of the things that you remember um, about being a little girl in Fort Collins? I remember the wide streets. The streets in Fort Collins are unusually wide. And I remember going to the city park on a trolley and going swimming and wearing a token for the trolley around my neck so I wouldn't lose it. And I remember going to school and listening to Mr. Roosevelt on the radio huh. during the war. Mm -hmm. And I remember playing on, there used to be lots of vacant lots here, and I remember playing in a vacant lots, hide and seek, and games like that. So you did a lot of those things during the daytime. What did your family do in the evenings? We listened to the radio. We have a radio from the Fort Collins Museum here. Was it similar to The this radio one? we had was what they call a console, mm. and it was on the floor, and it had a big speaker at the bottom. So the whole family would gather around the radio, and we would listen to Jack Benny and George Burns and Gracie Allen, and we would laugh and laugh. We loved Good. listening to the radio. You had a very favorite show that you and your brother liked to listen to. Yes, on Saturday mornings, we loved to listen to a show called Let's Pretend. And the sponsor for that show was the Cream of Wheat. So I always wanted Cream of Wheat for breakfast because I loved that show so much. They would tell stories, and you would imagine the stories in your head. That's wonderful. You got your world news from the radio. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the newspaper. And also we went to the movies and we would see something called Movie Tone News. And that was about 10 minutes of news that would be on before the feature came. What was the movie theater that you visited? There were two here that I recall. One was the America, which was on North College Avenue, and the other was the Lyric, which was on East Mountain Avenue. And they were both as big as the theaters that you go to now, which are divided up into smaller theaters, there would be two or three of these contemporary smaller theaters would fit into the America Theater, and it had a balcony. Wow, so many people would go to the movies. Oh, yes. How much did the movies cost then? It cost, for children, 10 cents. For adults, a quarter. Wow. So um, as you were growing, you went to uh, Lincoln Junior High. I did. And that is where the current day Lincoln Center is. That's correct. All right. And then you went to Fort Collins High School. I did. And, and, and that is now the CSU Arts Center mm. on uh, Remington Street, right across from the Botanical Gardens. And where the Botanical Barden Gardens are now, we used to go and sit and have lunch on nice days because it was a park. I think people still do that today Maybe they because do. it's so beautiful with it the is. flowers growing there. It is. Mm -hmm. So how did people keep in touch with each other as you were growing up? What are some of the technological advances of people communicating with each other? Well, it was mostly by telephone. Uh -huh. And in those days, we had operators for the telephone. So you would pick up the phone and she would say, number please, and you would tell her what number you were calling. And in Fort Collins, we had two kinds of telephones. One would just be a number, three digits, with no letter after it, and that was a private line, and they were very expensive. And the other one would be a party line, and that would have a letter after it, so you always knew if somebody had a private line or a party line. And sometimes when the phone would ring, 
and it wasn't your party, people would pick it up anyway and listen. And you weren't supposed to do that. But sometimes the people who were talking would hear other people breathing, and they would say, hang up, we're talking. And you would get one ring if it was your phone, maybe, or two rings if it was somebody else. There were as many as six on a party line. And you remember those experiences I do. a child. Did you listen in on people sometimes? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, most I didn't of the, find it very interesting. <laughs> most of the second graders see this as a phone. This is the type of phone that they see. And we have um, an example of a rotary phone from the Fort Collins Museum. Yes. And that would be hooked up to a telephone operator. So how did someone um, call long distance back then? It was very complicated and very time consuming and very expensive. They had what they called trunk lines, which mm. connected one city to the next. So if you wanted to call, let's say you wanted to call somebody in New York City. So you would call and, and tell the operator, the person you wanted to reach, the party, we always said the party you wanted to reach, and she would connect to Denver. And then the trunk line in Denver would connect to maybe Chicago. And then the trunk line operator in Chicago would connect to, let's say, Philadelphia. And then from Philadelphia, you would get connected to New York. All the time you're waiting while these connections are being made, it could take quite a long time. And as I said, it was very expensive. And then when you finally made the connection, you had to practically shout at each other to be heard because it was going through all these trunk lines. Now that was before I was born, so I only know uh, about it from reading about it, but I can imagine it must have been a pretty big deal. If you wanted to call somebody in New York City, it would have to be very important. But in 1915, they put in a transcontinental line which went from one end of the country to the other, and it went through Fort Collins. And this was the place that it connected. Yes. And whose voice was heard going Thomas across? Thomas Edison spoke on that first transcontinental line. So his voice went right through Fort Collins. And that's great. That's something that maybe a lot of people don't know. So telephone operators worked really hard, and there was an event that happened in 1913 where the telephone operators became the heroes of our town. They did. We had a terrible blizzard, and practically the whole state was shut down for almost a month in December of 1913, and people were frantic trying to reach each other, trying to find out if family members were all right and so forth, and trying to get supplies. So the telephone operators stayed at the switchboard. It was on, I believe, College Avenue at that time, until some of them fainted. They stayed so long trying to allow people to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. You can picture the switchboard. It was just a long line of connections that they had to plug into the wall, and then they all had earphones on to make the connections. Interesting. So prior to telephones, um, we did have another form of communication that people used. Tell us a little bit about that. We did, and that was the telegraph. And the telegraph was an interesting device because it allowed communications to go one letter at a time over specially designed lines that actually preceded the telephone. So the telegraph, in a way you might say, gave birth to the telephone. But the, you had to press a keys, tap out letters, and there was something called the Morse code, which was used to transmit messages on the telegraph. So perhaps the most famous one is SOS, and that's dot, dot, dot for the S, dash, dash, dash for the O, and dot, dot, dot for the S. That and means help. Help, help, help. So we have a, a small example of a keypad there. We do. Of the telegraph. We do. And that mm -hmm. is how 
telegraph operators communicated with each other about trains so that the trains wouldn't run into each other they would telegraph what line the train would be on and when it was coming so that the other operator would know and could convey that to the train conductors and everybody would be safe Neat. so eventually television came to Fort Collins what do you remember about that the first television that we ever saw was in a store window in about I'm going to say the late 1940s and it was oh maybe as big as this notebook like that mm -hmm. and it had little rabbit ears they called them rabbit ears on the top an antenna and little tiny pictures in black and white I bet you were fascinated by we that. We were. <laughs> to see people that we'd heard on the radio showing up on a screen was a fantastic thing. Was it a little while before your family was able to purchase a television? It was several years, and televisions cost a very great deal of money. They cost between five and seven hundred dollars at that time. You're buying a little tiny television set. They did get a little bigger and sometimes you wouldn't get any reception because a storm would interrupt it and all we had were these rabbit ears. So we would turn the rabbit ears to try to get better reception and there was a lot of static on the television mm -hmm. set. Barbara, tell me how photography has changed over time. Some of the things that you know about from um, the late 1800s to where photography is now. You were showing me a telephone a little while ago and people take pictures with their telephones yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Little tiny cameras on the telephones. Yeah. Well when photography began, photographers took pictures with very large cameras that had kind of bellows on them and then they had put their heads under cloth so that they could keep the light out. And okay. Okay. 